The Uluru Statement from the Heart is undoubtedly one of the most important public and political and legal documents uh, of contemporary Australia, and I'm sure it will be seen that way in the future. For those of you who uh, have only heard about it, I'll say a few things about it and then begin the main part of my talk. Now, it was, um, it was issued to the Australian, addressed to the Australian people on the 26th of May 2017. It had, it, it was a, a, a brief document, it's only a page and a half. Uh, and it's very succinct and in places poetic, but it does three things. Firstly, it talks about what I call deep time. That is the, the incredibly long occupation of Australia by the First Nations people. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial, and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. Having done that, the statement moves on and talks about the, uh, the situation of indigenous people, First Nations in contemporary Australia. And above all, the uh, way in which, in so many ways, uh, they uh, suffer the worst situation uh, in many social aspects in the country. Uh, and as the document says, these dimensions of our crisis tell, tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. So having talked about deep time and powerlessness, the document then moves on to uh, propose what uh, the, the uh, large number of people at Uluru agreed upon. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the constitution. And they were very clear that, that, that of those two things, one, they wanted a voice and they wanted it enshrined in the constitution. It then goes on, Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and the First Nations and truth telling about our history. In and then the, 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 final, the final passage. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. So that's the uh, Uluru Statement. Now I want to move on and do several things. I want to explain where the statement came from. I mean, it had its own history. It had its own provenance. I'll then consider the proposals in some greater detail, and then I'll look at the opposition. So that's the second part of my lecture. Firstly, the Uluru Statement. And secondly, uh, the current situation that we're in. So let's begin with the provenance. That is, where did the Uluru uh, statement come from? In many ways, we need to go back briefly to 1988, 30 years before the Uluru statement. Uh, this was the moment when at Barunga in the Northern Territory, uh, Bob Hawke was presented with a statement about the need to better define the place of First Nations people in the Australian constitution and in generally Australian politics. Hawke, of course, promised that he would indeed do this, but then found it much more difficult than he imagined. Uh, 
Consequently, the whole process of rec reconciliation was set in place in 2000, no, sorry, in 1991. And it was to go for 10 years. And after that period of consultation all around the country, there would be a document. Now, once again, uh, that didn't happen because uh, by then the uh, coalition government and the John Howard had come to power and there was no intention of producing a document as a result of all that process of reconciliation. So the situation remained as it had been uh, in uh, 1988. Now, Julia Gillard, uh, when she was in power, um, began talking again about the need for uh, a referendum. But as you know, she lost power and the coalition government of Tony Abbott came to power, but in many ways continued with this attempt to bring about some change in the constitutional position of First Nations people. And uh, Tony Abbott, in July 2015, uh, called together a gathering of 40 of the leading Indigenous people in the country for a meeting to discuss the ways to the future. It may surprise many people that Tony Abbott was the person that really did initiate this process, which resulted in the Uluru Statement. And his words at the time will also surprise many people. Let me just read you what he said at that meeting in 2014. This is a very important national crusade. It's very important to me. It's very important to the indigenous people of our country. And it should be very important to all of us who want to see our country whole. And for me, indigenous recognition won't be changing our constitution so much as completing it. So that was the uh, motivation that Tony Abbott expressed then in uh, 2014. But as a you know, following from that, uh, the, the process became serious and was funded by government. That is a referendum council or 16 member referendum council was set up. It by then had the bipartisan support, both of, uh, of uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten. And the process, uh, the process of uh, going out into the nation and finding out what the opinion of First Nations people were began. But before I move on, let's just recall when talking about the, where the, the uh, Uluru Statement came from, it's important to keep in mind, firstly, that it was initiated by government, and at that time, Abbott's coalition government. It was funded by government, and it had bipartisan support. So the Australian politicians, the political elite, said to the First Nations, go out across this huge country, uh, do as, uh, in, uh, consult with as many people as you can, and then come back and tell us what you wanted. That is, they were asked for the opinion of the First Nations. So let's move on to the next stage, and that is to consider, can consider the process by which uh, the voice was gradually constructed. It didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of a long process of consultation, which lasted from December 2016 to May 2017. There were 12 large meetings called Dialogues that took place right across Australia, from Torres Strait in the north, Tasman Hobart in the south, and also across the north and into some of the most tr traditional areas of Australia. Uh, a thousand, uh, sorry, a hundred people uh, were brought together in each of these dialogues. So what you had was a sample of over a thousand people 
all around Australia. There was uh, an emphasis on the traditional communities. The discussions were held variously in 12 traditional languages with translators. And so when 2,500 delegates met in Uluru, they brought together the views of many, many people. And they believed that this process was unprecedented. That is, in the uh, material supporting the Uluru Statement, uh, the uh, participants said, this process is unprecedented in our nation's history and is the first time a constitutional convention has been, has been conv convened with and for First Peoples. This is the most proportionately significant consultation process that has ever been undertaken with First Peoples. So what you have enshrined in the Uluru Statement was indeed a distillation of the views of all those people. Now, there were, there were uh, participants in to Uluru who put their view, put contrary views, uh, but they didn't uh, persuade the great majority. The great majority, uh, it seemed, wanted to begin with a voice, not with anything else, and they wanted the voice to be enshrined in, uh, in the Constitution via a referendum, because they had seen, certainly since the, uh, the, the 1970s, 1980s, a series of Aboriginal consultative bodies that had been set up and, and then had been changed by incoming governments. And this was particularly true of ANSIC. So what they wanted was something that couldn't simply be changed and abolished with a change of government. They wanted this enshrined so it would be permanent. So that's, uh, that, that's, my, uh, that's, that's my contribution to the idea of the provenance. Where did the Uluru Statement come from? Uh, what did it represent? And why did it emerge as it did? But as I said at the beginning, I want to move on now to the opposition to the referendum. Now, there were many people who were concerned about the emphasis that the Uluru Statement had said about having a referendum. Anyone who knows the history of referenda in Australia realises that it is very hard to pass a referendum that needs a majority of people and a majority of states. And most referenda, referenda in Australian history have failed. Now, in particular, uh, when, it was, uh, when it was put in place in the constitutional conventions at the end of the 19th century, 1997 and 1998, uh, they had bought the referendum from Switzerland. This was part of the constitutional government of Switzerland. And they thought the referendum was the ultimate demographic, uh, democratic procedure. After all, uh, Australian constitution, unlike many constitutions, was democratically uh, put together by people elected to the conventions. And those founding fathers wanted to make sure that if you change the constitution, you had to consult the people. But what they didn't know was that within 10 years, Australian politics would resolve itself basically into a two-party system. No such system existed when they were discussing the constitution. And what has been shown many times over is that a referendum needs the support of both major party groups. Without that support, it is very hard to get acceptance. So there's no doubt that when Peter Dutton decided not, for instance, to give his, uh, his uh, federal parliamentary party a conscience vote, but to impose his view on it, as, as leaders do, uh, that he would be voting against the referendum. 
Now that immediately presented difficulties to gaining majority support. But there are, there are two quite specific arguments that I think need to be considered. Now, the first is that because uh, so many people don't really know much about the Constitution, uh, very, very few people have read it. Um, they, they just know it's important. Uh, and there's a, a strong, uh, there's a strong uh, feeling in the community that meddling with the Constitution is not a good idea. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And there is anxiety about any change to the document. And the slogan which is now being used, if you don't know, vote no, is indeed an extremely clever and powerful slogan. It, it touches on that uncertainty that many people in Australia have about meddling with the Constitution. But there is a second argument which is powerful and which is repeated many times over in one form or another. And that is that what is being proposed is giving special rights to the First Nations people, which other people don't have. That it is uh, leading to uh, separatism, it is leading to division and the special rights are based on ancestry or on race. But above all, it's, it's an argument that it is undermining our sense of being one people. It is undermining uh, our, you know, our solidarity uh, and it is introducing um, special rights that uh, are not appropriate. Now, you, many of you will have heard these arguments, but uh, as an example, I just take three from a recent uh, radio program on 2GB in Sydney, where these views were put by three different people. That is the first one, uh, accused Labor of trying to create an exclusive group. The second person pointed to dangers of, quote, affording a small group of people an elevated right above all others to a say on everything. And then Tony Abbott, return to the fray saying it would create two classes of Australians, a few whose ancestry here could be traced back some 60,000 years and the many whose ancestry in this country dates only from 1788. Well, uh, there's no question that these are arguments that are having an important effect. And one has to be fair to say they are clever and they may well win the case for, for you know they may well win the case against the referendum but to understand uh, why we are talking about special rights we need to move on let me take you back to the uh, uluru statement in the uluru statement there were basically two arguments uh, in relation to the rights that uh, are, are going to be enshrined in the constitution. The first was the deep time, the uh, incredibly long period of First Nations history on this continent, 60,000 years. And secondly, the situation, uh, the, create, you know, the, the, the result of powerlessness, the appalling social and, and economic and and situation of Indigenous people. In other words, the great gap uh, in life chances, which we all know about. Now, what wasn't mentioned any time in the Uluru Statement, and has not been mentioned any time in uh, subsequent debate, is the, uh, are the international rights that Indigenous people have. That is, the discussion here has been almost entirely parochial. The First Nations people at Uluru were dependent on two things. They assumed they would get the support, the will, you know, the, the, the support of the general public, the goodwill of the Australian people, 
and secondly on the integrity of the political leaders who after all had set the process in motion and uh, in both those they've found much more opposition i think than they imagined would occur so it's important i think to move beyond australia and to consider the question of international rights which is where i'll now move Now, firstly, just a little bit of background. Now, the, the great movement for human right, international human rights, which took place with the creation of the United Nations in 1945, um, eventually picked up two things. There were certainly much discussion and, uh, and debate as there had been over many, many years, even centuries, on the rights of nation states, of the sovereign nation state. But after 1945, there was a great emphasis on individual rights, the rights of the individual, declaration of the rights you know, of, of, of humanities uh, as individuals. But at the time, there was little consideration of the rights of minorities, and in particular, the rights of indigenous minorities around the world. But gradually in the 1950s, the international community turned its attention to these rights. It gave the, uh, the, it gave the uh, running of this process to the International Labour Organization. Many people scarcely know it exists, but it had been set up as part of the League of Nations and it was the one institution that survived the end of the League of Nations and became part of the United Nations. And they had spent, uh, certainly since the, the first half of the, of the 20th century, because they were dealing with labor, looking at the conditions of work of indigenous people, particularly in South America. And so they became the uh, international body that was tasked with finding ways to define the rights of indigenous people, which they did uh, with a convention in 1957 called IL ILO Convention 107 about indigenous rights. It was the first such document, but it was, a document of its time and it was very assimilationist it assumed that indigenous people would eventually be assimilated into the the, the wider nations where they live but it took one very significant statement which was to have important implications in many places but particularly in australia and that is the question of land rights and so the document said the right of ownership, collective or individual, of members of the population concerned over the lands which these people traditionally occupy shall be recognised. Land rights shall be recognised. Well, now, did many people in Australia know about this? Or well, surprisingly, it was taken on board in Australia very quickly. Let me just uh, give you a little bit of background. Up until 1958, there'd been no national body pushing for Indigenous rights because most of them were state-based. After all, at this point, it was the states who had responsibility for Indigenous people, not the Commonwealth. Uh, so... Uh, the state-based bodies came together in 1958 because they realized that if, if they were to have the capacity to go international, particularly to seek uh, representation uh, in the United Nations, they had to have a national organization, not just ones based on the states. So in 1958, the Federal Council of Aboriginal Affairs was established in a meeting in Adelaide. And at that meeting, uh, one of the uh, one of the veteran um, Aboriginal rights campaigners uh, 
a frail old 79 year old lady called Mary Bennett, who knew about the ILO convention and had got copies of it sent to her from Geneva. She took copies to that first meeting. And the next year in 1959, the Federal Council of Aboriginal Affairs, later became Fakatsi, adopted land rights, basically the land rights as defined in the ILO convention as part of their campaign. And from that time on, it never ceased to be a major issue, land rights. But it wasn't just the Aboriginal, uh, the, you know, the Aboriginal organisations which took it up. It was also two of the uh, most significant reforming politicians, one state, one federal, both of who knew about and talked about ILO Convention 107. The first was Whitlam, who introduced land rights for the Northern Territory in 1975 and was uh, brought to fruition by Fraser in 1976. And the second was Dunstan, the South Australian Premier, who introduced land rights for people in the central desert areas in 1981. So both of, of, of those people were influenced, you know, basically influenced by the international development of Indigenous rights. And this continues to be the case. And this is, this is important to emphasise. Although these international rights and, and their evolution over this period, over 50 years from the 1950s, although this evolution is little known to Australian people, there's no doubt they influenced Australian development, both politics and law. And this is seen particularly uh, in the Mabo case of 1992. Um, in his lead judgment, Mr Justice Brennan made it quite clear that com the common law had to keep uh, had to uh, had to keep uh, close to the development of international law, particularly the development of human rights in UN conventions and also in the ju judgments of the International Court of Justice. He was very aware of bringing Australian common law up to date with what was happening internationally. And uh, another point is that the, the Mabo uh, case would not have got there had uh, the, 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 uh, the attempt by Queensland to extinguish all the rights of, of the Torres Strait Islanders hadn't been knocked out as a result of legislation about racial discrimination, which was based on international conventions. So whether seen or not, international conventions, international developments in, in, in law, these influenced what was happening in Australia. And above all, there's no question that the Mabo judgment did a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount on improving Australia's uh, standing overseas. And I mean, I personally experienced this in many parts of the world. It was amazing how many people, whether it was in South America, whether it was in Japan, whether it was in Northern Norway, uh, there were people who knew all about the Mabo case and how important it was. So that uh, the High Court then took Australia, if you like, into the mainstream of thinking about Indigenous rights. Now, it's also true that as the, uh, by 1992, there was a, an ongoing conversation, uh, particularly at the United Nations, usually in Geneva, about developing a more permanent uh, document about the rights of Indigenous people. And this took a long time with a great deal of negotiation. It was negotiation in which Indigenous people from around the world were represented and where Australia was represented. That is the evolution of the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which was passed by a massive majority in the uh, General Assembly in 2007. And it was introduced by an Australian, 
um, that no one knows about. Uh, and this, 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 this indeed was, as I say, a very important document. And Les Meltzer from Queensland, from Brisbane, was the person who stood up there representing the Indigenous people of the world, telling the General Assembly, explaining to them what the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, where it had come from and why it was so important. Once again, uh, very few Australians know about this development, but it's an indication that, like it or not, we can't escape the changing currents of opinion and law outside the country. And Australia, after some hesitation in 2007, signed up to the convention in 2009 with the, in, with, you know, with, with, with the Rudd government. Now, we didn't have to sign up to this. We chose to, and it was a signal to the world that we accepted the principles embodied in the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. It's inescapable. We have committed ourselves to this, and the, world, the rest of the world will, will look at us and say, well, it's all very well to say you support this. What are you going to do about it? So let's, uh, having indicated this was a signal to the world, let's say a little bit about the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. And I'll just uh, refer to three aspects. The first in the preamble says that uh, the document uh, recognises and reaffirms that Indigenous peoples possess collective rights which are indispensable for their existence, well-being and integral development as peoples. And then two of the uh, clauses of the uh, declaration Indigenous people have the right of self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. And thirdly, Indigenous people have the right to autonomy or self-government in matters relating to their internal affairs. Well, now, as I say, not many people knew about the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. Not many people knew that in 2019 we had signed up to it. And for a long time, there wasn't much to talk, discussion about it. And it, it's almost never been mentioned in the current debate. It wasn't mentioned by the people who drafted the Uluru Statement. And yet it was a very important international document which we had signed up to. Now, it, it perhaps not surprising that the coalition government uh, did not show any great enthusiasm, but they didn't say, well, we're, we are taking our signature away. We're rescinding that. And so when the, uh, when the, uh, when the new government came in and Penny Wong became foreign, foreign minister, she took up the question of Indigenous rights immediately. And she frequently, when she was talking, particularly in the Pacific, reminded them about the, the, the depth of, of Australian Indigenous history. Uh, it became one of her signature themes. And she, she actually appointed an indig she actually appointed uh, an Indigenous uh, ambassador whose job was to go out into the world and to talk about Indigenous rights. And Penny Wong, uh, the DFAT itself, has said, we, we reaffirm our support for the objectives of the declaration. So there's no doubt that the new government has, uh, has emphasised again and again and talked internationally about what we intend to do about the rights of Indigenous people. So we've not only signed the document, we've actually gone out publicly talking about our belief in its significance. Well, let me, uh, let me go back uh, and just remind you where we have been. You remember I began with uh, talking about the Uluru Statement. I talked about its provenance. I talked about the fact that it had been uh, 
a, a process initiated by government, supported by opposition, that it, uh, it, it, it therefore had been given a commission in a sense, it had been funded and they had been commissioned to tell the Australian people what they wanted. And when they did, uh, many, many people said, oh, no, you can't be serious. You know, you, we, we don't think that's a good idea at all. But uh, as I say, there's absolutely no doubt that, that that is what they wanted. But what I think is so important is to appreciate that what the uh, Uluru Statement wanted was in so many ways extremely modest in terms of what had been happening in the rest of the world. Let's just compare what was being proposed. That is what the voice to parliament was was to give a representative body of First Nations people the capacity, a permanent capacity, to advise and persuade government. It's no more than that. It's an advisory body. And there is no way in which it can force government to agree. Uh, everything will depend on how the, the, the members of the appointed body learn their trade about trying to persuade government and giving advice to government. Now, in so many ways, uh, the, the voice to parliament is simply what lobbyists do in Canberra. And people don't quite appreciate how significant the lobbyists are. But if you look in the, uh, in the documentation, there's a register of lobbyists, permanent lobbyists who do the same work in Canberra of advising and persuading. There are 884 lobbyists representing 279 firms who have 3,691 clients. So the idea that somehow giving a voice to Indigenous people will change the way our government acts is simply ridiculous. They, they will find the corridors of parliament clogged up with lobbyists, all 884 of them, and some of them coming from the most powerful organisations in the community, and far better funded than the, um, the, the Indigenous people are going to have if and when they go to parliament uh, with, uh, with, with their voice. But it's not just comparing the idea of a voice with the industry of with the industry, the large industry of lobbying in Canberra. It's to see what has happened elsewhere in the rest of the world, in countries that we can compare ourselves with. That is prosperous Western countries like Australia with indigenous minorities. And these changes have been taken, taking place uh, for the last 50 years. And as I say, apart from the Mabo judgment, Australia has not kept up. Let's just consider New Zealand, Canada, and the three Scandinavian countries that have the Sami minorities in the far north. Let's consider New Zealand. Well, firstly, New Zealand, the Maoris have five seats in the parliament set aside for them. Uh, and Maoris can choose either to vote for the Maori seats or in the general, they can't vote for both. But five seats in parliament, one, one chamber, not two, five seats are reserved for the Maori. There's also the Waitangi Tribunal, which was set up as a permanent tribunal in 1975. And that exists to make sure that government uh, follows the rights that were first set down in the Waitangi Treaty in 1840. And that anything that has happened since 1840 can be considered and the Waitangi Tribunal can take these concerns to government. That is, it is a voice to government, permanent and far more powerful uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a, um, a, a treaty to refer to. And it continues to operate as a fundamental part of the New Zealand uh, public and political life. 
then there's Canada. Now, Canada has always had treaties. Uh, Australians still, and this has been discussed in the last week or so, with John Howard saying it's impossible to have treaties with you, within your own country. Well, one wonders whether John Howard has any idea or is even bothered to find out. But Canada has had treaties since the 18th century. Uh, and that, that is when they were British colonies, but from the, the creation of the Dominion of Canada in 1867, Canada went through a process of treaty making of 50 years between 1870 and 1920, when the so-called numbered treaties, the whole settlement of the, of the Western Plains was done by a treaty, and those treaties still exist. But the treaty making began again in 1975 because there had been no treaties in British Columbia and no treaties in the north of the country. So Canada has started the, the modern treaty process and it is still ongoing. And there are 26 treaties that have been signed between uh, the federal government, not the, not the provincial governments, the federal government and the various Indian and in Inuit organizations. And in particular, uh, in the uh, in uh, 2000 or 1999, there was set up a self-governing province run by the Inuit in the north called Nunavut, and it still exists. I mean, it it it, it is a it is a development which at the moment would be unthinkable in Australia. I mean, it'd be like setting up uh, a new state in the north of Western Australia for the Kimberley. Uh, run by the Indigenous people for the Indigenous people. But as I say, these are developments which now uh, are perfectly normal outside in the rest of the world. But you recall I said we should look at New Zealand, Canada, but also the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden and Finland. Now they too, in the 1970s, uh, or 1960s and 70s were fairly assimilationist in their views. The Sami would be assimilated into modern uh, Scandinavian society. But particularly when the Scandinavians saw the way world opinion was moving, decided they would set up separate parliaments, the Sami parliaments, cited in the far north, uh, where the Sami people have their own parliaments, uh, where they deal with issues of concern to, to the Sami. This is, this is so much more than a voice to parliament. This is separate Sami parliaments. Now, this I think it's important to emphasize that what is being asked for with a voice to parliament is very, very modest and a very, very limited uh, uh, campaign compared to what has happened in comparable countries. Australia is backward. Apart from Mabo, there is little development for which we can be proud. We have fallen behind what has happened in the rest of the world. And the surprising thing is that this is nowhere, nowhere being pointed out or discussed in the current debate. Well, let me summarize up to this point and then conclude. Now, you remember I began with Uluru, talked about its provenance and its proposals, dealt with the opposition, in particular the opposition that said you're giving special rights to these people that they shouldn't have. And then I went, moved on to consider the important developments internationally, which whether or not Australians know about have been extremely important in developments within our own country. And that the present government has committed itself, committed itself firmly to supporting the ideas in the, in the, in the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. So whether or not we like it, we have committed ourselves to this and the world will be watching and the world will judge us. And so this takes me to my conclusion. Now, I think after the referendum, whichever happens, we will find that there is no way we can return to the status quo. Uh, 
if the voice passes, then I think there's no way we can stop the unfolding uh, of the rest of the of the of the project. That is truth telling, Makarata, treaty or treaties. And that is what we would need to do to bring Australia up to date with what has happened in the rest of the world. Equally, defeat for the referendum would not return us to the status quo at all. In fact, defeat might have a, a, a greater impact than victory. That is, defeat would be a profound, a profound and damaging blow to a whole generation of Indigenous leaders. Remember, the 250 people at Uluru were indeed carefully selected as people who represent, not only did they represent the whole of the country geographically, they represented everyone from urban, urban Aboriginal people to the most traditional communities in, in Australia. It was indeed the, you know, if you like, it, it spoke with the voice of the whole community. There were people who opposed it at the time and put their voice forward and their views were rejected. As far as we can tell, 80% and more of Indigenous people support the referendum. But above all, it would be the blow to those people who took the leadership. And you'll remember they concluded the, the uh, Uluru statement with the, the sentence, we invite you to walk with us. What a defeat would do and would say is that we're sorry, but you made a mistake. That is not what you should have. We know better than you. They're depend, depending as they did on the goodwill of the Australian people, on the integrity of the politicians, will be, will be rebuffed. And this generation of conciliatory people, uh, their time will have been brought to an end. And I think it's not that there will be an end to politics, an end to agitation, far from it. In fact, we will pass into a new era. And I think Indigenous politics will go in two directions. Back to protest in the streets, direct action, and back to the international, to the international scene where people like Les Meltzer played such an important role in the past. And those two directions will be embarrassing and, and, and difficult for all of us. Protests and the, the protests will return to the streets. And above all, there will be acute international embarrassment. The world will be watching and the world will say that Australia has once again fallen behind and has shown itself incapable of developing in the way many other countries have done so. And so I conclude with the voices of two of the major figures of this generation. Major figures who were at Uluru, Rachel Perkins and Noel Pearson. One, perhaps the greatest filmmaker that we have in Australia. And two, Noel Pearson, uh, undoubtedly the intellectual leader of the whole movement. Rachel Perkins said it would be, that his defeat would be seen as a vote against Indigenous people. Not to have the country stand with, with us would be a very significant blow. Now Pearson said defeat would be a complete tragedy for the country. I don't know how you could pick up the pieces after that. There would be a future of almost endless protest. Well, with those warnings, I bring my talk to the close and thank you for your attention. <laughs>